Hi, my name is Tammy Spellbring. I am the Deputy Director for Clinical and Treatment Services at Behavioral Health Services Division under the Healthcare Authority. HCA is dedicated to making the state of New Mexico trauma-informed, beginning with ensuring our staff is trauma-informed. HCA is providing training with Dr. Bill in what trauma and in informed care is that is based on SAMHSA's concept of trauma-informed approach. There is an increasing focus on the impact of trauma and how service systems may help to resolve or exasperate trauma-related issues. These systems are beginning to revisit how they conduct their business under the framework of a trauma-informed approach. SAMHSA worked with trauma experts in research and treatment as well as trauma survivors to help craft a definition of and concepts about trauma-informed approaches that would be relevant to public health agencies and service systems. Referred to variably as trauma-informed care or trauma-informed approach, this framework is regarded as essential to the context of care. These areas include a comprehensive working definition for trauma that includes the three E's of trauma, the event, which is the traumatic situation, the experience, the way someone emotionally responds to the event, and the effects, both the short-term and long-term outcomes of the event. Also, the four R's of trauma-informed care, which include realize, recognize, respond, and resist re-traumatization. Six guiding principles to guide us in approach and treatment that include safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support, collaboration and mutuality, empowerment, voice and choice, and cultural, historical, and gender issues. Through these trainings, HCA staff will have the information and tools to interact with others both internally and externally in a trauma-informed manner. Thank you and enjoy the training. I'm very glad you're here. I think this is some of the most important stuff we have to um, share with people. And uh, one of the things that helps us when we're in these sorts of events and trainings is to have a group of people that we talk with about it. So we're going to manufacture that group for you today and put you into a breakout room. And we will revisit those breakout rooms a couple of times. With this particular breakout room, I'd like you to start out with introducing yourselves, being good humans, right? Saying hello. And, um, and if you don't know each other, what you do in your organization. And think about what would you like to get out of this training? So think about those um, two things, introducing yourself and how you're doing and what would you like to get out of this training? Does anyone know when the brain or the cortex has its biggest developmental growth? It is? Sleeping. One to five. One to five, I love it. Thank you, Natalie, perfect. And uh, one five, it's true. And it, we could narrow it down if we really tried to like, you know, one to three or, you know, we could shrink it just a little bit. But the truth is your brain grows so much more from one to five than it does for the whole rest of your life. Now, things still happen and things still grow in your brain and there's rearranging and, and, all, and weeding and all sorts of things that happen. But that developmental growth is huge. And then... Growth continues and connections continue to be made until really our early 30s, okay? And so your brain isn't done cooking when you're born, right? Your brain is something that just keeps going. So let's look at some of the, some of the facts and things about the brain. Here's the first one. When a person is calm or in a state of mild arousal, and I'm going to guess most of you are in that state right now. Nobody's like... Um, distressed and flailing about. And, and I haven't noticed yet that anybody's laying down and sleeping, but I suppose that could happen. Um, but when you're actually just calm and in a mild state of arousal, your cerebral cortex is in charge. And your cerebral cortex are the two big gray lobes up at the top. There's a colorful version of it on your screen right there. Um, but that that's what we think of when we think of the brain. But the truth is the brain has a lot more parts to it. Um, and when, when you're calm and in that mild state of arousal, that is really, um, what we want. Like we want you in that state when we're doing trainings with you, or when you're having to think about something and solve a problem, but trauma 
when you're exposed to trauma, it disrupts the brain developing appropriately. And the way it disrupts is to interrupt your access to your cerebral cortex. So instead of being able to get into that part of your brain and think and solve a problem, uh, you get stuck if you have a significant amount of trauma interfering with you, okay? And so not a, probably not as good a problem solver because all learning takes place in the cerebral cortex. So sending kids to school, we need them to be calm and alert and present or they're not gonna take in the information. Training you at work, you need to be calm and in control of yourself or you're not going to be able to benefit from the content. Okay, so the reason that trauma is such a problem, first of all, it's horrifying and it's frightening and it's painful and it's all the awful things that are happening um, to you when, when you are being traumatized. But the reason it is a long-term health issue and a bigger problem in our society at large is because of this disruption of your neurodevelopment. You simply don't get to think as well or as quickly or as in organized a fashion as people without significant trauma. And it really depends on how, when that trauma happens and how it impacts your brain. But can you guess when the worst time is to have trauma? Given that we know that the biggest developmental curve is from zero to five, it's exactly the same. So during that time is probably among the worst time to have trauma happen to you or to witness it around you. Um, but it doesn't mean that bad things don't happen to us and we feel traumatized by it. But if I, um, I'm in my 60s now and if something traumatic happens to me this evening, I have my full brain capacity to cope with it, to deal with it, to to react against it, to all the things. But um, if I had a big backlog of trauma in my life, particularly while my brain was still developing, so all the way through my early 30s, um, that development isn't as good. And I will not have access to my cortex as often or as frequently as would be healthy or normal. So we're gonna look at um, SAMHSA's three E's of trauma as part of our quick review here. And here's what you need to know. Individual trauma results from an event, a series of events, or a set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as, and here's the next E, how do, how do you experience it? Well, if it's perceived as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, then you experience that event as trauma. Two people can have the same event, but you, may, you might experience it differently. So for sure, a child might have a different experience and feel something's traumatizing than an adult. For instance, have you ever seen a little kid get um, startled or scared and they scream and cry? but it was, you know, uh, a clown or um, so their brother jumped out at them or something like that. It doesn't seem that traumatizing, but to them, it felt for a moment like they had no control and, and uh, they could be injured or um, really emotionally distressing, okay? So the same people can have, different people can have the same experience, but it um, can have the same events happen, but experience it differently. And this is an important point to keep in mind. Um, the third E though is effects. So not only does an event happen to you and you experience it one way or another, you either experience it as I can, I can deal with this or ah, I'm being traumatized. I'm being, my life is threatened kind of thing. If that's the truth, then um, you are going to have both short-term and long-term effects effects. Okay. And these effects, when we talk about that, they are um, threatening and lasting adverse effects on your functioning, your mental, physical, social, emotional, and spiritual well-being. You can have negative effects on any or all of those areas. So this framework for understanding trauma, the three E's, events happen, depends on how you experience them, that experience them, 
is going to impact the kinds of effects you have from them. This framework was developed by a working group of researchers, practitioners, trauma survivors, and family members convened by SAMHSA. It's important because it creates this framework for understanding the very complex nature of trauma. There's no one list I could give you and say, here's the traumas in the world. Here they are. Um, what we can do and we will look at is categories of trauma, what types of trauma you can have. But again, it really depends on the individual's experience of those things to decide if they really, really are traumatizing. So how and when did we become so aware of trauma? It was something called the ACE study or the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. The ACE study was the largest scientific study of its kind. It happened in the early 90s and they analyzed the relationship between multiple categories of childhood trauma or ACEs. And what you see on your screen right now are the categories of trauma. Um, and they fall into those three sections, three categories of abuse, two for neglect, and five for household dysfunction. Um, and it was the biggest research study of its kind with over 17,000 participants, okay? So when you have that many, I'm a researcher. I was thrilled to have 218 in a research study that I did. 17,000 is just an unbelievable amount of data. And when you have that kind of data, it really helps you make um, a lot of inferences about what is impacting what. And so um, one of the biggest eye openers from this ACE study was the inclusion of those household dysfunction categories. Because these items are not directly about um, a kid's behavior. These, uh, these items are about the experience they have inside their family or their household. And we're talking about childhood experiences because we just talked about the fact that your brain is hugely developing when you're very young, and then it continues to develop all the way up until our um, uh, mid twenties and even into our early thirties. So um, this was very reinforcing for all of us who um, first of all, couldn't figure out why um, abuse and neglect were the only things that were being looked at prior to this. And secondly, it let us know that when we pay attention to household dysfunction, uh, we're really reinforcing that context matters. It really matters. The family that you're in, the household that you're in, the community that you're raised in, those sorts of things have a difference, uh, make a difference on, well, how much trauma you're exposed to and how you might respond or react to it. Now, a couple more fun facts about this study is that 62% of those 17,000 were over 50 years old. So people were answering questions over the age of 50 about their childhood. And at that time, the ACE, before we knew all this about when the brain developed exactly, because that information came on the heels of this ACE study, um, people thought it was 18. Your brain must be done growing by then. You're done with school, right? And um, it wasn't true, but that was a common way to think about things back in the 80s and 90s. And so um, they were asking all of these people who were well-employed and had um, health care insurance and were filling out really a, a survey about their health and asking them these questions. We found out 62% over 50, 77% of them were white, and 72% had attended college. So you could probably recognize this as a very white privileged population, okay? This is not a representative sample of the United States. It was, um, it was anyone who was enrolled in Kaiser Permanente Health Insurance on the West Coast, okay? And so they were um, being pulled in for wellness checks and um, asked to fill out this survey and the stunning thing about it was even this, this group who is pretty privileged, pretty educated, well-employed, and I think most importantly, had access to all the healthcare they could possibly need or want, still identified these childhood problems as impacting their, their life, uh, even at age or over age 50. 
And so the impact of early negative or adverse childhood experiences um, really stays with you, okay? But because this group was so privileged, um, remember the original study participants were well-employed and well-insured, they did not identify all of the most common, tr common traumas. So my question to you is, what do you think might have been missing from the ACE study? Um, what traumas did we not have on that list? And I can show it to you again. And if you have your handouts, you can cheat and look ahead because they're listed on the next slide. But what, it, what isn't on this slide? Does anybody have any ideas? Yeah, throw them in the chat. I see some chat spark in there for a minute. Uh-oh, Mark, I don't know your acronyms. Social determinants of health. Hmm. Can you be more specific? What though these would all be social determinants of health too, I guess, right? So what are the missing ones? Melinda, poverty, I can't agree with you more. Hmm. Poverty, lack of health care, lack of education. Um lack of social supports. I'm just kind of talking. Yeah. Okay. And and I'm not sure that's exactly what I'm uh, looking for yet. I'm looking for traumas that happen, not what's missing to help you cope with a trauma, right? All the things you're mentioning would help me deal with the fact that a trauma happened, which which could be helpful even to my health in the long run, but not quite what I'm looking for, although poverty is one of them. So let's go ahead and look at this next one and see if we can add some in. Um, again, remember that original study uh, was all privileged people. And these are things that might not have um, been on their radar. So one of them was school and community violence. And we, I'm sure that you can all get on board with this. We know about bullying in the school system and online. We know that community violence occurs with um, attacks and assaults and rapes and all sorts of things can happen in your community. I hope they're not happening in your community, but they're absolutely traumatizing, right? And so then there's a whole category on disasters and accidents, things that are unintentional traumas. Um, and uh, we were just talking, uh, well, I was at the very beginning of this event about Florida having that second hurricane hurricane in a couple of weeks. Natural disasters are hugely traumatizing. They uh, just thousands and thousands of people had to um, uproot themselves and go somewhere else to find safety. And so it, that move is traumatizing yet. And then to weather the storm, to have it roaring over you. And then and on top of natural disasters, we have man-made accidents, okay? So we have industrial accidents and farming accidents and um, car accidents and house fires and all sorts of things. So not on purpose trying to traumatize somebody, but definitely people are traumatized by those events. Another category is invasive or prolonged medical procedures. This one took a minute for people to get their heads wrapped around because there was a big pushback from the medical community that you can't call our work traumatizing. We're saving people's lives, except that people who have to go under, think things like um, chemotherapy, kidney dialysis, um, certain surgical procedures, especially if they're invasive to your body or they take a long time, months and months and months, uh, that turns out that that is absolutely traumatizing, even if you would die without it, it can still be traumatizing to go through those processes. Then there's discrimination and oppression. Um, and uh, once more, people did not want to recognize that as a, uh, a trauma that could be categorized this way. But um, honestly, the pandemic um, really highlighted a lot of inequities for, for many of us. And the World Health Organization during the pandemic issued a statement that trauma and racism have been have a very direct impact on health and behavioral health. And so that forced people to kind of shift their stance on that and think about how discrimination and oppression are traumatizing. And then the final category is the one that was offered up by somebody in your side of the Zoom here, and it's poverty. And poverty is a real nasty one because 
not only is poverty itself traumatizing, I, I am overwhelmed and traumatized by not having enough money to buy food, by not knowing if I'm going to be secure in my apartment or, or have a safe place to sleep, um, by not knowing if I have enough to protect my children and feed them, those sorts of things, very overwhelming and traumatizing. But also, if other um, traumas enter uh, my life, I have nothing to buffer myself with. People with money are able to buy safety, to buy health care, to buy a new house, um, do those sorts of things. And so when you live in poverty, um, not only is poverty a trauma, your inability to block other traumas um, is pretty significant. So Here's what I want to tell you. Some people, some organizations, some states still use the original ACE study as a little survey tool to see the people that we work with, how traumatized are they? And I want to tell you it's no longer sufficient. You need to find a tool or a survey that includes these additional categories because all researchers now who have worked in the trauma field for the last, well, since it was the 90s, so the last 25 years, right? at least, um, they've all added questions and ways to screen for these additional missing ACEs. The next thing we're gonna do is talk about triggers because sometimes I think people get a little confused about triggers and I want you to understand how triggers work. So triggers are things that make you think or feel like you're in that trauma situation again. So, um, uh, and a lot of and and one of the rules around SAMHSA's rules around um, being trauma informed is don't re-trigger people, don't re-traumatize people. And all the people I ever work with would say, I would never re-traumatize somebody, or certainly wouldn't do it on purpose. But you can't really avoid re-traumatize re-traumatizing all people because they're traumatized or re-traumatized by small triggers that you can't possibly know what everybody's triggers are. So let's work our way through this weird slide and see if I can help you figure out um, how triggers work. So first of all, I showed you 10 categories of trauma. Then I added five more. So now I want you to think about the fact that there are five different categories of trauma. And it's not about how many times something happened to you, um, so, for instance, if uh, um, somebody beat you up, it's not that you got mugged and beaten three different times. It's that you had community violence. That's a category. OK, so we count categories, not individual traumas. And one of the reasons is it's hard to count traumas. What if you're a kid who's raised in an abusive home? I mean, you could have hundreds of incidents before you get out of that home. And um, <clears throat> and so. So we count categories and categories tend to tell us a lot about the person in the population. And so when you have four or more categories, that's the tipping point for changing how your brain reads and responds to the world, okay? So when you have less than four categories of trauma, your brain works in what we would say is sort of the average or typical way that a brain works. But if you have four or more of those categories, abuse, neglect, household dysfunction, disasters, uh, med medical emergencies, things like that, if you have four or more categories, it makes you much more reactive than, uh, and doesn't allow you the, um, it's gonna react, your brain's gonna react for you. That's how it disrupts your neurodevelopment, okay? So um, four or more categories causes you neuro, uh, neural dis disruption. I just want you to keep that in mind. Now, what's that mean when you get that neural di disruption? Well, first of all, what it means is what fires together wires together, and that's where these triggers come from. So when you're, you were interrupted by trauma, and whatever it was that was happening to you happened, your five senses were on fire. And whatever was happening that you could see, hear, smell, taste, or touch was wiring together with that trauma event. Now, I frequently tell the story about working with a young man who um, 
was doing, uh, was in a day treatment program with me and I was his therapist and he attended this classroom because he had, he had significant childhood trauma. He was only eight when I was working with him, but when he was four, he and his mom had been in their apartment and, um, uh, mom's abusive boyfriend kicked in the kitchen door, came into the house and proceeded to beat his mom. He thought to death, but beat her to unconsciousness and, um, and left her a bloody mess on the floor. And he had kind of scooted away and hid. He was, uh, even at age four, he was with it enough to call 911 and the mom eventually was okay, but she wasn't okay in that moment. He witnessed it. So that's his first layer of trauma. And then secondly, all the professionals came in to the, to the rescue scene and he ended up being taken out and um, put into foster care temporarily because mom's unconscious and unable to care for him. And that's his second layer of trauma there. Um, uh, but eventually he and his mom were reunited and he just had a really hard time, um, settling down and being appropriate in school. And so he got put into this day treatment program where you can get both mental health, um, services and educational services at the same time. And positive you have services like that in New Mexico. And, um, he did pretty well. And I was his therapist and he seemed to enjoy the, the programming and, um, you know, smaller classrooms, more individualized attention, all that stuff, except every Friday he would have some sort of meltdown, throw things off his desk, threaten to hit his peers, talk back to the teacher who usually he got along just fine with. And, um, and it was baffling to us what was going on. So we began to try to unpack that behavior and figure out what happened here. And, um, it took us a long time to figure out what was going on because we looked at, is it 10 a.m. on Friday? Did the, the did the big incident happen then? Nope, that wasn't it. It was a weekend thing. Did it, um, uh, is he have some sort of aversion to math or spelling? Was it what was happening academically on Friday morning? Nope, it wasn't that. We changed the schedule up, gave him opportunity to do different things. Um, eventually what we did finally figure out was that it was the smell of popcorn. And every Friday morning, the staff was making a big, big batch of popcorn so that the kids in the program could have fun Friday. Meaning that if they were doing okay, they got to pick their afternoon event to watch a movie or play in the gym or play board games in the library. And, it, and during that time, of course, they could have snacks. They could have popcorn, they could have chips, they could have Kool-Aid, whatever. And um, the smell of popcorn wafting down the hallway caused this little guy to lose his mind every Friday because when he and his mom um, got attacked by that man, they had been making popcorn in the microwave. So that was hardwired into his experience of being unsafe. But the problem is that's a, it's one of these hidden triggers. How could you know that popcorn is going to set this kid off? They didn't report it. He can't say to me, Bobby, I'm okay until I smell popcorn and something I lose my mind. No, he can't put those things together. When he smells popcorn, the sensation and the, the scent is read by his brain and his brain says, popcorn, that's dangerous. That's when we got, that's when your mother got almost beat to death and you better, you better be on guard. And he, he would get anxious and he would get upset and he'd start taking swings at people. And he was really sort of off the hook and out of control all over the smell of popcorn. So this message here is not that you can know everybody's triggers. The message is that you have to know that being traumatized means that you are going to overinterpret danger. And when you overinterpret things as dangerous, it leads to overreactions. Was he unsafe in the school? No. We, and we even stopped making popcorn on the floor. We, we went somewhere else and kids could go and pick up their own little serving of it if they wanted. But um, he wasn't unsafe. He liked me. He liked the teacher. He mostly got along with his peers. And so it was his overinterpretation of this is a dangerous environment because of what I smell led to his overreaction, taking swings at people and doing things that he shouldn't. Now, when youth behave that way, our typical response is to punish them. OK, if we try to punish a trauma response, 
All we do is exacerbate the shame and make it worse, okay? If we are literally punishing a trauma response, it's confusing to, the, to your brain and you're gonna fight harder. You're gonna be even more upset about things. Um, so this is, uh, this slide is just to help you understand that there are breaking points here, that you have a certain amount of trauma that you can tolerate as a human, and then it starts rewiring your brain. As your brain gets wired with trauma, you have a lot of triggers. Um, another super common trigger um, is, um, or an, an example of this is when um, kids in foster care hoard food. Now, if you think about it, you know why they're hoarding food. At some point they were hungry and somebody didn't give them what they needed nutritionally. But foster parents want to pull their hair out and they're like, why are they hoarding food? I give them three meals a day. They have access to the snack cupboard. I never use food as a punishment. What is going on here? But it's because it was wired together early on. And so it's impossible to know everybody's triggers. And I think my final message on this slide is, if people are overreacting, you should assume it's a trauma response, not intentional bad behavior. This kid was not trying to get kicked out of class. He was not trying to cause problems for his teacher. Um, he felt completely justified in getting upset and angry because it felt like his life was in danger. All right, moving on. How does trauma affect the brain? Um, this is a pyramid called the ACE pyramid. And originally this pyramid did not have the bottom two layers. It started with adverse childhood experiences. When they first did the study and put it together, they were like, so bad things happen. It disrupts your neurodevelopment like I just taught you. And when your neurodevelopment gets disrupted, you are very, very likely to have social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, okay? What do I mean by that? Well, think about my poor little guy in that class. Is he, is, do you think he's great at making and keeping friends when he loses control that way? Other people are like, eh, I don't know if I wanna pick you for my team. Um, that sort of thing. And so you're going to have some social problems because being triggered all the time. Um, emotionally, he feels like his emotions are out of control. He can't really, um, he can't manage the level of anxiety that is sparking when he gets triggered. And cognitively, if that's all happening in my brain, do you think I'm learning my multiplication tables? Do you think I'm learning how to spell all the words? I'm not. It's really difficult. And so cognitive impairment, eventually think of co the cognitive impairment as developmental gaps. And it, the gaps exist because we are being disrupted in our ability to learn, okay? So it started with the adverse, ch adverse childhood experience that might happen in your life. It disrupts your neurodevelopment, which causes impairment in one, two, or three different areas. And then because, does that sound like a fun life to you? I'm just checking. Not really. Then, then this is what happens. Because it's kind of miserable and you feel like people don't like you and you feel like I don't know how to control this and I don't know when it's gonna happen, um, you start to adopt what, are, what we consider health risk behaviors. Anybody wanna take a guess at what those behaviors might be? What kind of behaviors might people do to make themselves feel a little better when they have a miserable life? Self-harm. Self-harm, yes. Yes, some people turn to self-harm, not necessarily for suicide, but because somehow cutting and bleeding releases some tension for them. What else? Substance use. Uh, Melinda, one more time. Ooh, uh, your sound cut out. I saw you move your lips and I couldn't hear you and I heard it the first time. Folks, drop your answers into the chat if that's easier for you. Substance um, use. Yes, substances. Thank you, Mary. For sure, all sorts of substances. So we start with sugar. 
and we move to cigarettes and then we're into weed. Then we're into pills. Then we're into alcohol. And there's no order here. You could jump into any of those things at any age, right? But for sure, substances change how we feel. And so just to give ourselves a break or numb ourselves a little bit, we'll use substances. And if we do enough of that, we end up having all sorts of diseases, disabilities, and social problems. Now, at the in the middle where I said adverse childhood experiences, if you have four or more categories, you're disrupted your neurodevelopment. If you have six or more categories, and that's out of 15, so you, there's a lot you could have. If you have six or more, you will ex you are likely to experience an earlier death than your non-traumatized peers, okay? And I'm not just talking about a year or two, two decades, two decades, 20 years lost on average for people who have six or more. And now I want you to think about the people that you serve in social services, behavioral health care, child welfare, developmental disabilities, special education, all of the special services that we need to offer to people who need an extra hand. What do you think their ACE scores might be? And what do you think the ACE scores might be of the people around us doing the work? In social services, the average is thought to be between six and eight. So they right away are up over the top level of everything that we're talking about. What do you consider a disability to be a disability? Um, if, you, if you have a disability, it seems to me that that would be an ACE and I don't know where that would fit in here. I guess disrupted neurodevelopment. Yes, it, and uh, Karen, it really, disability is such a broad word. And so we'd have to get more specific. Did, were you in a car accident and lost your ability to walk? That's a huge disability. Or are you in the DD population and you were born with a different brain than other people? Do you know what I mean? And so that's such a broad word. I can't give you a singular answer there. So sometimes it's related to trauma and sometimes it's a what, what would be considered a birth defect. And so nobody did anything too intentionally, but you still are going to have a different life. Um, and stressful life to, to not have your full human capacity to deal with the life, right? So it can have an impact for sure, Karen, but uh, disability is a very broad word. And sometimes trauma causes disabilities. Okay, great. All right, well, let's, uh, the last thing I wanna point out on this slide is that, um, how am I doing? Not too bad. Um, the, there are three um, hot links on the left-hand side of that slide, and they are tiny videos. Well, they're not tiny like little, but they're short. They're only two or three minutes each, and they teach you something about the brain, and they're super quick and easy. And if you get this handout as a PDF, those are hot links as well, and you can find them, okay? But they come out of Harvard, and they really teach you about brain architecture, how intera human interaction impacts that and how toxic stress derails that development, okay? I think all together, there's seven minutes, all three of them put together. So if you can take a minute and check those out if you are interested in the brain side of things here, okay? But for us, we're gonna go on and talk about those two things that we just highlighted. People with a lot of trauma start to do risky behaviors. And those behaviors include the top row here, lack of physical activity, smoking, alcoholism, drug use, and interestingly, missed work. So if you have colleagues or supervisees who are chronic absentee people, instead of thinking of them as lazy or avoidant, you might want to think trauma response because that is a very common hallmark of people with significant trauma. And I wanna let you know, this is the money chart, folks, because when you have any or all of these behaviors, you're going to have physical and mental health issues, okay? So, and most of your clients are going to have enough trauma that they fit on this, on this table somewhere, okay? But I want you to be aware that 
some of your colleagues might also. And um, they're likely to have significant ACE scores because people with trauma scores tend to go into the helping fields. Why do you think that is? They want to figure themselves out. Okay. It might be about some self-reflection and like, what happened to me? <laughs> Let's see if I can figure this out. I, I agree with you, Karen. I think that's a really good good point. Um, but I also think they want to interrupt um, patterns. I think they don't want to be part of the next bad generation. I think they want to stop child abuse and neglect. I think they want to improve people's um, health and well-being. And so they want to give back. They want to help. Okay. And so we show up in higher numbers. Hi More of us in social services have ACE, higher ACE scores than, let's say, in the corporate world. OK, so just be aware of that. The people around you may very well um, have scores or you. I might be talking to you. All right. So when you participate in those risky behaviors, you are likely to have these are the top 10 problems that kill people in the United States, by the way. That's why it's put together this way. And we know that trauma or traumatic stress contributes to these problems. So let's look at the brain for a minute. How does the brain work? And what do we mean when we say it gets disrupted? So in order to tell you how it gets disrupted, I have to tell you how it works just in general. So here's how it works. Think of this as a road through your brain, okay? And start over on the left, the way we typically read, and look at that word, input. So something comes, becomes, uh, makes you become aware of it. And you're aware of it because of your five senses. So whether you see something or hear something, I often use the example of a smartphone, that your smartphone might light up over on the corner of your desk, right? And that's input to you. And you can observe it and see what, what, what do those lights look like. Then when you see it, you can interpret it. I got a call or a message or it's just an ad or, um, oh, I have another appointment in an hour, something like that. You interpret what you see and then you process that information and decide what could I do about it. So for instance, if I'm sitting here teaching and my phone lights up, I uh, might glance at it and think, can I just ignore this? And if it's, um, and almost all the time I say to myself, yes, you can and turn the phone over and do something else. But what if I, what if today um, one of my parents was in surgery? I might wanna pay attention, right? And so I, and I can do that up in the higher cortex area of my brain. I can evaluate my options. I could flip the phone over and ignore it, or I could pick it up and look at it. Or I could say, you know what? This is an emergency call. Everybody take 10 minute break. I'll see you back, right? And so I have all sorts of ideas and can evaluate my options and make a plan on how I want to respond. I'm allowed to respond to the input that comes into my world. That's a healthy brain with ideal conditions, okay? So now let's say that instead I observe something, input comes, I observe it, and I interpret it as dangerous. Think about my little guy smelling the popcorn. He's like, oh no, danger smell. So instead of going up into the higher part of his brain, and processing it and evaluating options and coming up with a plan. Instead, he takes a shortcut in his brain, never gets up into these uh, cort the cortex, these big lobes up here, but it happens down in the middle part of your brain. And he has a big reaction. And he's, reaction, he's reacting because his stress response system got activated by that smell. And he doesn't have any choice. He can't get past that danger sign. He doesn't get to say, I'm not going to be scared or it's not as dangerous as I think. He just gets tossed right into start throwing things around and run for your life. Okay. So that's how that bypass system works. And this is why when, um, if you, uh, if somebody came charging at you with a knife, you don't call a meeting to discuss how am I going to handle this. You duck and run, right? Or hold up something as a wet, as a shield, something like that. 
your brain will tell you exactly what to do in that moment. And and because your brain has one real job and that's to save your life, okay? So we do want our stress response system activated because we want to be able to fight or flee or get the heck out of the way, okay? But here's the problem. With repeated stress, that little express route becomes the super highway of reactivity. Um, this is what happens when your stress response system is stuck on. And this is that's what we mean when you have four or more categories of trauma. Your stress response system is always on. It's like, boy, you get a lot of trauma. I'm just staying on. I don't trust you to take care of yourself or to respond appropriately to things. I'm going to take over and you're going to be hyper reactive to things. And your express route becomes the only road you can take cognitively. So people who have four or more get stuck in this super reactionary place. And the other thing, do you notice what's missing? So chop off the top part of that road. They don't learn how to process and problem solve things. They don't have that opportunity to figure out how to plan for the future or evaluate the pros and cons of something. Look at all the things that are whacked out in red there. Those are missing skills for highly traumatized people. And life is hard enough, even when you have all those skills. So that's what we mean when we say disrupted neurodevelopment. This is how your brain thinks when you have a significant trauma load. So let's talk about the impact of trauma. First of all, trauma happens. It happens to most of us. As a matter of fact, since we've had a worldwide pandemic, no one can say they're untraumatized. Everyone has lived through a trauma. But if you were a grown up when it happened, you got to decide how you responded or reacted to it. If you were a kid, it, it could have been pretty, pretty significant. And the research is just now rolling out about all of the additional problems the youth have today because of our, our visit with the pandemic. Um, but trauma and chronic stress happen in, in humans and, um, and because humans aren't always great at how they treat each other. And those things, trauma and chronic stress, activate your stress response system, okay? So it kicks in your stress response. And what does that mean? It means that you are gonna go back to using your survival skills instead of your cognitive skills, okay? And so you know what your survival skills are, right? They are fight, flight, or freeze. Now, if they're survival skills and they're saving our life, what's wrong with that? Well, remember what's wrong with it is the fact that those people can't access the top smart part of their brain. They don't have a choice about how they respond or react. So that is a problem. But let's take a look at those survival skills and unpack those just a little bit. So first of all, I want to just make this point. Survival skills are the same as a trauma response. You can use those words in uh, interchangeably, okay? When people are in fight, flight, and freeze, that's because they have an activated stress response system, and that is that is a trauma response or a survival skill. So those skills are intended to help us escape or deter perceived threats. They also can help us alleviate pain or distress that's caused by perceived inescapable threat, okay? So that's why the survival skills kick in. They're, they're really supposed to be helpful. However, here's the catch. Survival skills don't look pretty, all right? Survival skills, think about what your survival skills are. Fight is the first one. So survival skills look like aggression. Or flight, running away. Survival skills also look like impulsivity. And finally, freeze. Survival skills look like self-centeredness. That's when you sort of go inside your own head and, and um, it's all about you. Well, it is all about you if you think you're not going to survive. That's, that's just what it is. And so... Um, the other thing, so first of all, people don't always think about what survival skills really look like in the world, right next to you, right? Um, but I want to unpack them just a tiny bit more and say, let's talk about aggression for a second. I bet everybody understands aggression 
um, as as fighting that the if somebody tries to hurt you, tries to hit you, tries to knock you over, tries to um, push past you, those sorts of things, you can all recognize that as aggressive behavior. But I also want you to think about um, uh, aggressive behavior as mean comments or looks or um, not letting you uh, work your way into a group or if there, if we made a big continuum of ag aggressive behaviors, they come from very mild to very outrageous. Okay. And it's all those behaviors. Your brain is going to use any of them. It thinks it can do to help you escape that threat. Okay. Um, impulsivity is another one that people are like, what does flight look like? What's your survival skill of flight? We all think, well, you know, if a bear jumps out at us in the woods, we're going to, we're going to run. That's, that is your flight survival skill to run and protect yourself. But I also want you to think about it like um, not waiting your turn, snatching things away from somebody else. Cause you're just not thinking about how that's going to impact them. You're that I want that. So I'm going to take that. Um, even, do you remember this in the pandemic, buying excessive amounts of toilet paper? That was an impulsive thing. Toilet paper did not help us with this particular pandemic at all. And yet it was what people panicked about in stores for a minute there. And it was uh, it was amusing if we weren't all so confused and overwhelmed by what was going on, okay? So these survival skills are uncomfortable to be around and we tend to punish them. But I want you to think of survival skills as ways that any reasonable person might act in order to escape a threat or alleviate pain, okay? So stop interpreting survival skills as bad behavior because when we do that, we punish them and we're literally punishing them for having a survival instinct, okay? All right. Here are the four R's of trauma-informed care from SAMHSA. Now, folks, I don't always think that the federal government gets everything right personally. I don't know about you, but um, they got it right this time. They did a good job of studying and understanding trauma, okay? And these four R's are real, are excellent guidelines for being trauma-informed. Okay, and so let's go through them uh, one by one real quick here. And I want you to realize how much trauma is out there. So much. Uh, they're estimating that between uh, pre-pandemic, we used to say 30 to 50% of people um, might have four or more. That's a lot. It's a ton, right? But now those estimates have gone up even higher. And now it's more like 60 to 80% because of all the things that happened during the pandemic. So there's a ton of trauma out there. So almost everybody who comes in touch with social services or government services have been touched by trauma. Okay. And you should just assume that. But the other thing on that first R is you should also understand there are a lot of potential paths for recovery. Not everybody goes to therapy. And therapy isn't for everyone. There are many other ways for people to cope with trauma and get their life back on track. So now you realize there's a lot of trauma out there and there's a lot of things that can help with trauma. The next R is recognizing the signs and symptoms of trauma. And I hope what I did with several slides ago was convince you that um, if people are overreacting to something, big time overreacting, you should assume it's a trauma response. You shouldn't assume that they're just, what, wild, crazy, can't control themselves. It's a trauma response. So when you see these big overblown reactions and, and you think this is just too big for this situation, it doesn't really make sense. Um, I want you to think, oh, it could be a trauma response. And who might you see those signs and symptoms in? Not just your clients, not just the people you're working with or for, but your colleagues, people in your family, other staff members. Um, start recognizing that you might see some of these trauma responses all over the place. And when and if you do, we must do the third R. We have to respond differently. 
We can't just punish them for it or tell them they're not allowed to have that response because it's not polite, uh, that sort of thing. And so instead, we have to respond differently. And that's going to include trying to calm them, trying to help make them feel safe, not being demanding and not being punishing. And so we and not only do we you have to know to do that, it needs to be in your policies, your procedures and your practices so that people are trained to respond in a trauma informed manner. And then finally, the last R is that resist re-traumatization. And I know none of you would do it on purpose, but know that if you're making popcorn someday, it could trauma, it could trigger somebody. And so how can you, what can you do? Well, you watch for those overreactions and you be willing to say, oh, is this disturbing to you? I'm willing to try a different way, okay? And so don't, um, you know, don't be hard nosed about it and be like, well, too bad. This is life. You're going to have to tolerate some of this. All right. That's the, that was our review. And now we're going to turn the corner and talk more specifically about secondary traumatic stress. Okay. So secondary traumatic stress is the emotional duress that results when an individual is exposed to the firsthand trauma experiences of another. Now, the truth is we're all hearing about everybody's trauma all the time. And if you watch the news and if you watch um, documentaries and if you're paying attention to what's going on in the world, there's a lot of trauma going on all the time and we're seeing it and taking it in. Um, <clears throat> however, when you work in social services, you have a much higher rate of absorption of other people's traumas because often they're getting some sort of service because of some sort of trauma. And so you may or may not have your own high trauma score, but you are exposed to a lot of other people's trauma. And that means that you are sort of, um, uh, you're likely to have some trauma responses yourself. And then it can get all sorts of complicated, right? So first of all, let's look at who's really at risk for having secondary traumatic stress. Child welfare workers, for sure, because they're seeing those um, abused kids and those families where there's violence and maltreatment or even sexual abuse. Therapists, counselors, and social workers in general, because they're out there trying to help people and obviously the things they're helping them with have to do with some trauma. People who are very empathic, people who... Um, uh, they just feel, their hearts feel so much for other people that when other people are hurt or hungry or upset, they literally themselves feel hurt or hungry or upset, okay? So you, they feel, that's what empathy means, that you're feeling things that other people are feeling. Um, people who have unresolved personal trauma. So you have a childhood history of some trauma. You do not want to talk about it or deal with it. You think you can just ignore it. But when you're exposed to other people's trauma, it triggers your feelings and your things around about it. Heavy trauma caseloads, working where you only deal with really high-end trauma kinds of situations. Social or organizational isolation. Um, and that happened a lot during the pandemic, of course, that we felt more isolated from others and we weren't all together in our buildings and things. And so the more isolated we get, the more the impact of secondary traumatic stress can have on us. And then finally, inadequate training, not knowing uh, what to do about trauma and what's going on. But the bottom line is you, you are definitely at risk for secondary traumatic stress just by virtue of where you work and, and the clientele that you deal with. <clears throat> so I also want to spend just a couple of minutes going over some related conditions and terms. Um, secondary traumatic stress, some people use different words for that. Um, and one of them might be compassion fatigue, okay? So compassion fatigue is just a less stigmatizing way to describe secondary traumatic stress. And, um, and the way they characterize it is um, you're exposed to other person, other people's trauma, and you feel... Uh, you feel very compassionate about them and it drives your work. You want to be helpful. You want to do the right thing. You want to protect and support them, those sorts of things. 
but you do so much of it, you're exhausted. And um, it's compassion fatigue itself is characterized by lessening your compassion over time. So if you feel like I'm not quite as in tune with my clients as I was 10 years ago, you have some compassion fatigue going on. You were real concerned about them and cared a lot about them. And now you're just like, oh, no, not again. That kind of thing. That's compassion fatigue. Another word is vicarious trauma because it didn't happen directly to you. We think of it as vicarious. But really what this um, is, this particular title is used for in the research, at least, is cognitive changes in your own brain, specifically in the areas of trust safety, control, and even intimacy. And what that means is you see so much negative stuff in, uh, in that secondary traumatic stress that you start to believe that the world is really an awful place and no one's safe, and it changes how you think about the world. I've been in the trauma world for over 25 years, and um, and I will say that uh, one of the examples I would give is that I am I rarely walk into a large group without sort of scanning the room and thinking 60% of these people have so much trauma, it changes how they function in the world. I don't think everybody does that, but that I've just been in it for so long. I'm constantly doing math in my head and thinking about how much trauma is walking around me. And, um, and that's what vicarious trauma is. It changes how we think about the world. I had a woman who worked a lot with um, sexual abuse um, victims. And she even worked with sex offenders for a while. And, uh, and eventually she had to leave the field because it was impacting her relationship with her husband, who was a perfectly nice guy, never had any issues with abuse or, or anything like that. But she could only see negativity around intimacy after a while, because that was all she was dealing with day in and day out for decades. Another form or, or condition that we see in secondary traumatic stress is, um, and this one's just sort of mixed in there, is burnout. And so some people don't talk about secondary traumatic stress, but they say, I'm burned out. I'm burned out on working with these people. I'm burned out on um, all their problems, those sorts of things. But in the research, burnout is reserved for um, general occupational problems, not the population. So do you have any stress about your work? Do you have too much paperwork? Do you have a boss who doesn't understand you? Do you think the rules aren't fair to everybody? That's, um, that's occupational stress. Can you see how that's not related to the clients or the people? It's not trauma specific. And the um, hallmarks of burnout are emotional exhaustion and a reduced feeling of accomplishment. But it's about the job more than it's about the people, okay? So that's what we mean when we talk about burnout. And then there's one more term, and it's compassion satisfaction. And it's, of course, the opposite of what we're talking about. And that is having positive feelings that are derived from helping people who are legitimately traumatized. And, um, and if you feel like I'm making an impact, I'm saving somebody's life, I'm giving them a fresh start, uh, I'm making a meaningful contribution, that buoys us up. We get so many positive feelings about that from being a competent provider or service provider um, that, that it allows us to tolerate a fair amount of compassion fatigue or vicarious trauma. Does that make sense? And so that's sort of the thing that, that helps us on the other side, compassion, satisfaction. So to that end, we're going to take a couple of minutes before our break and talk about how do we benefit from and how can we expand our own compassion, satisfaction. And I pulled a few things out of the research to share with you, and here they are. First of all, have you heard of this concept of Teflon versus Velcro? It's not an uncommon part of um, early trauma trainings where they talk about your brain either functions like Teflon and things slide off of it or like Velcro and it's sticky to it. And here's the truth. When things are threatening to you, it sticks in your brain. 
your brain does not forget that popcorn. Because when popcorn, when I smelled popcorn, it was dangerous and it's never going to let go of that. That's why they have trouble letting go of triggers because the, it acts like Velcro in your brain. On the other hand, if I see a pretty sunset here, it's lovely, but I'm probably not going to remember much about it tomorrow because it doesn't, my survival doesn't depend on it. And so it acts like Teflon and it was nice, but it just slides away. And lucky for me, the sun sets every day, so I can check it out the next time. But that's the that that the Teflon versus Velcro is just about how does your brain pick what it keeps and what it lets go of? How come you can't remember something pleasant, but you can remember that time somebody insulted you? That sort of thing. Okay. So that's one concept. Just remember. And I guess what I want to say about that is if things are going to slip away from you, you might as well enjoy them while they're happening. Okay. So expand your compassion by enjoying things. Secondly, there is a lot of new research out there on happiness and how do we find joy? How do we create joy? How do we share joy and happiness? And there's, there's podcasts about it and there's apps about it. There's articles about it. And if you're interested uh, in looking at that stuff, learning about happiness uh, can really buoy us up. It can help us understand that we have some say over what we focus on and whether or not we can uh, be happy. Then there's this concept of a double shot of dopamine. So here's, a, here's the interesting thing. When you help somebody, you get a flush or a, a, a rush of dopamine in your brain. And it's a feel-good neurotransmitter. And it's running through your, your brain because you did something to help another human and it makes you feel good about yourself and the world. Now, the double shot of dopamine is the other person that you helped also gets a shot of dopamine because somebody thought I was worthy enough that they helped me. And so I can feel good about myself. I, I was helped in a situation or... Um, given something and uh, it makes me feel like I am worth something. And so I get a shot of dopamine. So folks helping each other and helping other people, double shots of dopamine, always a good thing. As a matter of fact, um, I use this as an intervention with children sometimes when they're fussy and unhappy about things and tantruming. Uh, I will say to them, hey, I'm sorry you're busy with that right now, but could you help me with this? Could you help me set the table? Could you help me unpack the car? Could you help me uh, walk over to grandma's house and give her this bowl of cereal? Whatever it is, if I can get them to help do something, it is like a flip switch. And that's dopamine. And then I feel good because they feel good. So try for that double shot of dopamine when you get a chance. And then the last thing I want to mention is something called a loving kindness meditation. So in a loving kindness meditation, um, for those of you who meditate, you probably know this is a very common kind of meditation, but it's a very rote thing that you go through in your mind. And what you um, are doing is sending thought energy. You're creating thoughts in your mind about somebody else and saying, um, I'm going to pick Karen because I see her little face here on my screen. I only see a couple of you. And so I would say in my head, let's say I want to send Karen some loving kindness meditation. In my head, I'm going to say, Karen, may you be safe. Karen, may you be healthy. Karen, may you be happy. Karen, may you feel like you belong. And the idea is that I do that three times. I walk, I walk through that meditation three times about Karen. And the interesting thing is, I feel more positive about Karen when I'm done. And so you, the theory is that you should start with yourself. You should focus on yourself and give yourself those statements. Then pick somebody like a Karen or a Mary or a whoever and do it uh, about them. And then once you get the habit of that, pick somebody that bothers you. Pick somebody who gets under your skin and irritates you. And try saying those phrases just in your mind and see if you don't feel different about them and they don't treat you differently because of that the next time you see them. It's a strangely powerful 
uh, meditation. And so loving kindness starts with yourself, moves outward through nearby easy people and then distant, more difficult people. It takes five to 10 minutes, depending on how many people you're going to go through. But see if it doesn't shift your thinking and feeling about those people, which would increase your compassion satisfaction. How many have you experienced in the last 30 days? Now, this is not a comprehensive list. It has a lot of things, but I'd like you to read through each of the words yourself and come up with a number. How many of these things have you experienced in the last 30 days? And you may find yourself minimizing. It wouldn't surprise me. These are work colleagues that you're putting your number in front of. And while you're not revealing intimate details, you're saying, oh, I have some symptoms here. And so this is a list of common stress symptoms. These symptoms are important problems, uh, are important because the problems with having these symptoms extend beyond the symptom itself. So for instance, if we um, feel exhausted, that itself is a problem, but when we feel exhausted, do you think our client care is as good as it could be? So the symptoms themselves, especially when you start stacking them on top of each other, causes us to have compromised work or compromised client care. A lot of times providers will feel ineffective. And the truth is measuring secondary traumatic stress predicts who will leave the field. And I don't know about you, but I don't want any of you to leave the field. Uh, I think we already have a workforce crisis and we need as many helpers out there in the world as we can possibly get our hands on. And so I don't want people to be leaving the field and yet everyone is experiencing a handful of symptoms at minimum. Your numbers, the people who were willing to participate, and I wanna thank you again for participating, range between four and 10 four being the low and 10 being the high. And I'm gonna say, those of you who wouldn't answer, we're gonna assume you have a dozen and you didn't wanna put it out there. Um, and so <clears throat> there are other symptoms that we could mention. Um, oops, sorry, numbness or um, uh, definitely aches and pains. And uh, while we have physical ailments on there, what we don't have is the bad back and the bad neck and the bad knees and the bad shoulder, those sorts of things. Um, and how about just a lack of motivation? That's a symptom. I don't care anymore. Okay. And so um, if you can identify any other symptoms that you think might uh, contribute or be an offshoot of secondary traumatic stress, feel free to throw it in the chat. But let's move on with how do we identify secondary traumatic stress in ourselves and in the people that who, who might work for us? So it's, this is especially important if you're a supervisor. So identifying secondary traumatic stress can be done through informal self-assessments. You know, like, the, like uh, when we used to read magazines all the time and they'd have quizzes in there. Are you stressed? Answer these 10 questions, <laughs> you know, and those sorts of things. And sometimes doing those sorts of things, and you can find them on the internet now, um, all of those sorts of self-assessments, uh, they can help you clarify um, if you have some trauma history or what your emotional relationship with work is and what kind of symptoms you're having. So it's any kind of informal uh, self-assessment. And it could even be, hmm, I'm going to like just think about it and reflect, how's my body feel today? How's my back? How's my head? And when you do that kind of um, reflection and check in with yourself, it gives you information about how you're feeling and doing. Um, there is also something called a reflective supervision model. And in the reflective supervision model, uh, which I would recommend, at least for part of your supervision time, you pay attention to the emotional content and responses of your worker, not just where's the next report and what do I need to uh, sign off on for you? And here's your new list of clients and those sorts of things. So, and supervisors have to pay attention to the job. I'm not telling you to not pay attention to the job, but can you take the first 10 minutes of your supervision time to check in with the human 
who's sitting across from you and how are they doing? Because it turns out that when we do that, first of all, there's a little dopamine to give out. And secondly, um, you feel when you feel more connected to your colleagues and supervisee supervisor relationship, um, you feel better about the work that you're doing out there. So pay attention to your connections and your emotional content. And then the third way to identify secondary traumatic stress is more formal assessment. And to that end, I shared a handout with you that I hope everybody got called the ProQual, P-R-O-Q-O-L, and it's a survey. And it stands for Professional Quality of Life. And um, if we had longer time in this training, I would have you all fill it out. It takes about 10 minutes and then put you in breakout rooms to discuss where do you fall? Because it gives you a score of compassion, satisfaction, and secondary traumatic stress and uh, compassion fatigue. And so it, uh, it really gives you some different scores and it's quick and easy to do. It's free and available online, but I gave you a copy and I gave you the instructions and the interpretation in a three page handout all together. And I recommend it strongly to all supervisors and to ask their supervisees to do the ProQuil once a quarter. So it's not a daily or weekly thing, but about once a season or once every three or four months to fill it out and then go over it together and watch what happens to the scores because it's not like an IQ score where you get a score and you're gonna stick right around that score for the rest of your life. This one can go up and down. Maybe you have seasonal issues with work or maybe you had a really bad thing happen at work and you drop down for a while, but then you work yourself back up to liking your job, that sort of thing. So it's a really, um, it's a very well used and well researched piece of free formal assessment that you can use. So let's say you find some secondary traumatic stress. Um, well, actually you didn't find it yet, but you wanna prevent it. How can I, I have a group of people that I work with, I don't want them, I don't want them to be so stressed that they can't do their job. What can we do about preventing it? Well, you're sitting in one of them, psychoeducation. Having training about how this work affects us helps us understand what's happening, okay? So doing psychoeducation and, and appropriate training can be helpful. Secondly, good clinical supervision can often prevent because you get to unpack all the things that happen in your sessions or your interactions with clients, and that can be helpful. Um, skills training, how do you handle, do you get training about how to handle um, uncomfortable situations? How do you handle when people are unhappy with you or your work? How do you handle when people are angry about your um, department or those sorts of things? And so what kind of skills do you need to be able to cope with that? Uh, there are also self-report screening uh, that, that the agency, your organizations could give out to help you see where does everybody fall on some of these scales. Um, somebody mentioned in the self-care part, uh, community care groups. And that's true. And they come in all shapes and sizes, right? So it could be a group of people who get together to take walks in the woods on, uh, or in the, you guys don't have as many woods. I, I'm a woody. I, I live in the woods. <laughs> so uh, walk, in, walk outdoors in nature, or you could have a group who has a book club, or you could have a group who studies stress and comes up with strategies to try to see if it can impact it. Um, lots, uh, lots of different ways. Uh, the, those kind of community care groups also could support, support sobriety. They could be those sorts of groups, or they could be related or attached to a faith organization where you're with like-minded people who share conversations about what's happening in the world. Um, flex time scheduling is a strategy for prevention, and it's not something that uh, government employees generally get to use very much of, but uh, when employees have uh, flexibility with their schedule, they often feel better about their work and, um, and feel like I can adjust things to fit my life. And that helps them avoid some of that secondary stress. Um, having a self-care buddy system saying, hey, I, I struggle with this sort of off and on. Could we get together and talk every other week about how we're dealing with this difficult work that we do? 
Um, uses of EBPs, which is um, evidence-based programs. And, um, uh, and the reason that is a preventative kind of thing is if you feel confident that what you're doing is effective, you feel better about your work. And you feel, um, you feel like, I'm not, I'm not hurting people. I'm not contributing to the problem. I'm actually helping them get better. And that is a strategy for prevention. And then finally, really concrete things like exercise, good nutrition, and the right amount of sleep really help prevent you from tipping over the edge there. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit more about this later because at the at the end of our uh, last hour together, we're going to go over all sorts of activities that we can um, engage in to help prevent or eliminate secondary traumatic stress. But let's say you already have it. You're already pretty darn stressed and uh, not sure you want to keep doing this work or you're a supervisor and you have uh, and you see these symptoms in the people who work for you. And what can you do to support or help them? First of all, by all means, evaluate it. Don't pretend you don't see it. Let's take, let use the ProQuil, start there because it's free and easy and accessible and see, yeah, am I, is it what I'm really seeing? Are, is, are they burned out on what they're doing? Uh, let's check in on them. Um, using cognitive behavioral techniques or CBT can also be a strategy for intervention. Excuse me. They, um, uh, Again, CBT helps because, uh, in one sense, it helps because it is an evidence-based program. And so you know that it has been effective with other people before. And secondly, it changes how you think about what, what you're working on or what's going on. Um, it is really about changing our thought patterns. And, um, and if you can think about things uh, in a positive way, or if you can detach from thinking about your part of the problem or causing some of the stress and problem, uh, that can be helpful. Any kind of mindfulness activity, like um, walking or meditating or doing that loving kindness meditation, those are helpful interventions. Um, that Back to that reflective supervision, having a supervisor who checks in emotionally, not just about the work. Uh, and, and again, that doesn't have to be for the whole supervision. But if it's a piece of the supervision, that is a more effective way to supervise people. Having a caseload adjustment, if you're overwhelmed with a certain kind of case or, or you're having a, a string of trauma exposures and you need uh, to have a little break from that. Um, doing formal debriefing. So when things happen, when things are rough, um, uh, let me think about an example for you. In that day treatment program where I was working, uh, occasionally we would have to hold a child. We would have to hold a youth because they were trying to hurt themselves or somebody else. And so we would have multiple staff holding them so that they couldn't hurt somebody else. But that's a lot of trauma. I don't know if you're aware of that, but first of all, you involved in holding somebody down against their will is traumatizing. Them being held is traumatizing to them. And so there's a lot of trauma flying around those. Um, and a lot of times in organizations, it's just like business as usual, the hold's over, we send the kid home or, or they go to the hospital or whatever. And, um, and nobody goes back and debriefs. How did this happen? How did you do during it? What do you think about after it? Is there anything that we should change and how we address these things? Really just going through the motion of a formal debrief, asking what happened and what should we do about it and what's our plan moving forward? Really, really takes the edge off of being traumatized over that event because it was addressed and unpacked in a serious or formal way. And it can really um, decrease the negative impact that the event has on the people who were involved working with that event. Um, getting a change in a job assignment or a work group, you may hit a wall. And if you hit a wall and you are having so much secondary traumatic stress that you're like, done up to here, maybe you need a new assignment. Maybe you need to try something different or new. You, you will have to decide for yourself, but no one should keep doing work that continues to harm themselves, okay? No one should keep doing jobs that makes you feel worse and worse every day. You either have to figure out a way to treat it or, or intervene with it, 
or you might think about change, okay? Uh, if you're a supervisor and, and if you have EAPs, I don't know whether you do or not, um, EAPs, EAPs are employee assistance programs. So do you have programs that you can refer employees to? I see my friend Karen is shaking her head. And so um, you can refer your supervisees to programs or to treatment or to support groups or exercise classes or whatever it is you have. And EAPs come in a lot of different varieties. So I don't know what, exactly what you have there, but they can be very effective. And then finally, psychotherapy, because treatment works and people do recover. Um, but not everybody has to go to therapy. Are there any of these other things that would take the edge off for you and help you um, uh, intervene and interrupt that secondary traumatic stress? So remember, if, the, if intervention is needed, folks, the symptoms are disrupting your personal or professional lives. Serious symptoms require serious solutions. Don't be afraid to do something about it. As a matter of fact, you'll thank yourself for it later. All right, we're, uh, let me make sure. Okay. Uh, just checking my chat up there to make sure it was okay. And we're gonna go on to what I consider to be the solution, which is we've got to build more resilience into our workforce. And part of that is just acknowledging that there's they're swimming in trauma and, um, and not pretending like it's just a job. I'm paying you to show up and do your job. Uh, instead saying, I get that your job is particularly tough because you're swimming in trauma. And so let's go back, circle back to SAMHSA again. So SAMHSA had those original four, um, four points of being doing trauma-informed care. And then they added these six guiding principles. So this is these are the principles to the four R's that we discussed earlier. Um, and it's vital to know and practice these six guiding principles of trauma-informed care um, if you want to take the best care of your clientele and or your staff and yourself. So the four R's are central to the six guiding principles, and all of these pieces are going to work together to provide the basis of the trauma-informed practices that should be followed, not only for clients, but also for our workforce. However we decide we need to be, whatever we're doing to serve our clients well and fairly, we should at least be treating our staff that well, okay? It is not about abusing your staff to get them to do the right thing with the clients. It's about really changing the whole culture so that everyone is being treated with care. So let's go through these one by one. First and foremost, and it's first for a reason, Safety, okay? Safety um, is required for people to feel uh, safe in, their own, in the space and in their bodies. Staff and the people that we serve need to feel physically, emotionally, and psychologically safe. Foundation of safety is specific to environment and based in experience. So you might have a place that you feel safe in. You might have a room in your house that is the most comfortable and, and safe space for you. Or out in nature, you might find a space out there that you think is particularly safe and enriching or fulfilling. Supervisors, your office should be a safe place. Your office should be a safe place for everybody who, the, who you work with. And people, if you're out there working with clients, you need to figure out a way so that you are safe with them and they feel safe with you. So safety is number one on purpose and it's pivotal to the experience of feeling like you are um, being helped and that you can connect with that person. Next is trust and transparency. So in order for people to trust you, the bottom line is Follow through with what you say you're going to do. If you say you're going to do something, do it. Don't tell them things that you can't deliver on. And don't surprise them with things that they, they didn't have a heads up warning about. Okay? So 
The other thing is, though, that's about people working with clients. It also applies to your organizations and your departments and your divisions. Operations and decisions should be conducted with transparency. Things should, you shouldn't come in to work and find out they've changed how things are happening and nobody told you how, when, or why, okay? Building and maintaining trust with staff, clients, and family members of those receiving services means that we make transparent decisions as leaders. And we say why we're making this decision and when it's going to be launched and do you have any questions or feedback for us? Not being afraid of those conversations, okay? And so if you don't have that kind of trust and transparency from the top down, I want you to understand that you can't expect your staff to go out and treat clients that way. It's not how it works. You either have trust and transparency woven through the organization or you don't. And so if you feel that this is true, and I do feel that Sam's principle is true, you need trust and transparency transparency to do trauma-informed work. It starts with your organization and make sure that you are being um, clear and transparent about what's happening in, in your work world. The next one is peer support. So this is one of my favorite ones, and I'm really glad that it got put into the six guiding principles because um, peer support or people with lived experience belong at our organizations in these jobs and in our communities. And they have the ability to connect with clients and issues more than people who don't have trauma experiences or lived experience. In addition, uh, there is just tons of research that when you add peer supporters to your programs, you get increased attendance, you get less dropout, you get people following through on interventions and things. And uh, it just really is hugely beneficial. But when peer support first came around back in the 80s and 90s, we thought they should just volunteer to help, you know, because they've been through it. So they probably want to give back as opposed to saying you're a valuable staff member as well and deserve to have reasonable pay for the work that you're doing. So now we see more peer support and people with lived experiences in our staff and on our teams. And um, they are, um, they're a key vehicle for building trust, establishing safety and empowering people because they're also a living example of bad things happen and we can get through it, or and I can hold down a job, those sorts of things. It promotes healing through shared experiences. The next one is collaboration and mutuality, true partnering and leveling of those power differences. Um, it recognizes that healing happens in the context of relationships and in meaningful sharing of power and decision-making. The real um, impact of this, and if you went to SAMHSA um, workshops and learned about this, what they would be telling you is that um, you should have people with lived experience at all the meetings. You should have clients at all the decision-making meetings as well. And we're not just talking about a meeting about the client, we're talking about meetings about how should we spend our money next year? What are the programs that are needed out in our communities? These shouldn't be decided in gray rooms somewhere in the back hallway. They should be decided with a collaborative group of people, including community members, people with lived experience, staff, and administration, making those decisions together. That's a hard sell for a lot of places, but it's definitely the goal. The next one is empowerment, voice, and choice. It's, it's linked definitely with the last one. Um, but what we're talking about here is that strengths are recognized and validated. And um, we want to hear what people have to say, not just in a, a survey evaluation, but we want them to have a voice about what is their life really like and what would be truly helpful. Um, and to do that, we have to believe that um, people are capable of sharing appropriately and um, telling us, and that when they tell us something, we should believe it. 
Um, we also have to believe in their ability to heal from trauma and not assume that they're broken permanently. Um, and when you have empowerment, voice, and choice, you can keep building on what everybody has to offer instead of just responding to perceived problems and deficits. And then finally, the sixth guiding principle is acknowledging cultural, historical, and gender issues. So remember, that was the last part to get put on that ACE trauma pyramid. That very bottom layer was historical and cultural trauma. Uh, it took us a long time to sort of accept the fact that uh, we have to acknowledge, especially here in the United States, that, that we have strategically and structurally caused harm to different cultures at different times in history. And we all know what, what I'm talking about. We have to act actively move past cultural stereotypes and biases um, and acknowledge that humans are humans and everyone deserves um, appropriate care and respect and the time and space to heal. We also can um, leverage the healing value of traditional cultural connections. A lot of times there's been this movement to disconnect people from their history and their culture and tell them that was old, that was wrong, that was not real science or whatever we say when we do that. And But instead we're learning now, no, it's none of that is true. We need to go back and value what other people have found to be helpful. And um, that is gonna help us address historical traumas. It's a big order, these six guiding principles. But it, and, and maybe we think of it as more aspirational. It's not like you can do a checklist and you're gonna be like this next month. But you can think about how do you apply each of these guiding principles in your own work and how would you like to see your organization apply it across the board? One of the first things I think you should think about is psychological safety. Um, and this is just one little slide on psychological safety. And I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time here, but except to, to, to go through it real quickly with you. Um, first of all, say it out loud. I want people to feel safe in this organization. I want people to feel safe where I do my work, okay? And make it a priority. What can I do to make it safer? And, in, and then here are some cues for you. First of all, facilitate everyone having a voice and speaking up. Literally, when you have a, if you have a meeting, my guess is like many, many meetings around the world, um, you have a few people who talk a lot and a few people who don't talk at all. And um, you have to intentionally facilitate space for everybody to say something. So I would interrupt myself in a meeting and say, Mary, we haven't heard anything from you in the last two hours. What are you thinking about? And literally, you're just like, you're stopping and saying, you're important. You're a person in this place and um, and you need to have space to, to share your voice. And um, so facilitate that. And that's your job if you're running a meeting or a lead person in that arena. The third thing is establish norms for how failure is handled. So what happens if somebody makes a mistake? Do they get shamed? Do they get blamed? Do they get docked time or money? Um, or do we acknowledge that we all make mistakes almost every day and we learn from mistakes and they're not all deadly or death defying and um, we need space to make mistakes and then correct things and move forward. But you have to make the, those norms in your group and wherever it is that you're working and then create space for new ideas, even wild ones. Um, we wouldn't have any of the weird things and technology we have today if people didn't have crazy wild ideas, right? You'd wait a lot, a long time for me to discover that we could send uh, text messages through the air. <laughs> you know, I would never, that's not my kind of science. And so I need to hear other people's wild ideas and what new solutions might be out there. Oops, I didn't mean to click that button. Let me go back one time. The last one was, and this could be the hardest one. Maybe that's why I skipped it. Embrace productive conflict. Not all, not all conflict is bad. Sometimes we got to stand up for something that's not right. And we need to um, be able to tolerate and have those hard conversations without um, uh, 
just getting rid of people because they talk too much or because you don't like what it is they have to say. So this was just a little uh, foreshadowing because in two more weeks, there's another training coming up and we're gonna spend, uh, take a much deeper dive in psychological safety. Okay, you can learn more about the six areas that address the biology of toxic stress from this woman, Nadine Burke Harris. She's a doctor, she's out in California and she wrote this book called The Deepest Well. In this book, First of all, get the book. It's an excellent book. And it talks about the long-term effects of trauma and adversity. And it talks about what we can do as adults about trauma and adversity. And so um, here are the, the six areas that she discovered and did research on and, and, um, and has a practice now that promotes this sort of stuff. And she came up with six core areas that if you take care of them, you can reduce the toxic stress that you're experiencing from your work or from secondary traumatic stress. First of all is sleep. Um, and that makes sense. If you Did you know that not, uh, not letting somebody sleep is the fastest non-medical way to make somebody experience psychosis? Um, that if you go long enough with zero sleep, you, you have a psychotic experience, it's, it's pretty universal. And so we need our sleep and, um, and we're not very good about sleeping and lots of people have sleep issues. And um, when we don't even sleep our kids as long as they should be sleeping. So think about sleep, um, exercise. A lot of people grow up and think, I don't have to exercise anymore. I don't have gym class anymore. No coach is telling me to do anything. I don't like exercising, I don't wanna sweat. All of the things, they're all excuses, people. Your body was designed to move. And um, back in, you know, early days of humanity, you often moved between 15 and 30 miles a day. You were just on the move, kind of nomadic, going places. And your body is designed to move. And the more it moves, the more it self-tunes itself. And when we sit around and do nothing but watch Netflix, it hurts our bodies. Some people will say, um, I, I can't move because I have a bad back or I can't do this because I have the uh, a frozen shoulder or, or I, got, I hurt my knee playing basketball in college and so I can't do these things. I wish I could, but I can't. I've got all these aches and pains. And I'm gonna tell you that Nadine would tell you and I'm gonna tell you, you have all those aches and pains because you don't move them. The more you move, the healthier your body is whether you like it or not. And you don't have to run a marathon. Just get up and do some walking, some stretching. You stuck in an office chair all day? You could do chair yoga. It's all over the internet. Take Do 10 minutes of it. Uh, there are all sorts of things you could do, but we are designed to move. Good nutrition. Uh, and we've always known them, right? What we put in our body gives us the energy to do the things that we do. And we should eat probably more healthily. Um, I'm not judging you. I say that to myself every day. I should eat a little bit more healthy. Um, we should also practice some sort of mindfulness. You should be aware of what you're thinking and how your body feels and how you're responding to things. Um, I heard a phrase uh, a few weeks ago, and it was be relentlessly present in your body. And in order to do that, you have to stop what's happening and think about how's my body feel? Am I relaxed? Am I tense? Do I have pain? Do I have tingling? Do, and just check in. That's another way to be mindful and to have some self-reflection. Pay attention to your mental health. And if you need assistance, find a good therapist. And healthy relationships help us stay on track and stay healthy. Um, if you're in non-healthy relationships, think about how you could move away from that. Each one of these things should be scheduled into your daily routine. So I'm gonna run through them one more time. Folks, you should get enough sleep. And that means turn off the screens, avoid social media, wind down, and you should get seven to nine hours of sleep regularly. If you're not in that range, 
you probably aren't getting the right amount of sleep. Move your body, stretch, yoga, workout, take walks, eat healthier. Don't beat yourself up about not eating perfectly. Just add a few more healthy things into your day. Have a piece of fruit instead of a candy bar as a snack in the middle of the afternoon. Um, add another, another vegetable to your lunch or dinner. Again, don't beat yourself up about um, not eating perfectly, but add a little bit more of something healthier in. Please practice mindfulness, and I'll give you some more ideas on that later. And protect your mental health. You can increase your resiliency and protective factors. You can connect with others. You can intentionally take care of yourself. You can um, take your vitamins and your medicines the way you're supposed to. There are a lot of ways to protect your mental health, but pay attention to it. And finally, those healthy relationships. I want to remind you that you deserve to love and be loved. You're a human being and human beings are driven to connect and driven to be in community. Even if you think you're an introvert who doesn't like very many people, we thrive when we have positive connections with other people. And if we trap ourselves in negative, unhealthy relationships, that's a real problem that has to be addressed. So all of this is related to that old saying about needing to put on your own oxygen mask first so that you are healthy enough to help others. The more we care for ourselves and the more we're, the more we are available to others and the more we actually can care about them. If I care about myself, I naturally care about others. If I don't care about myself, well, why do I care about you either? Um, so watch out for that. How you treat yourself is probably how you're treating others. Self-care is not a luxury. Self-care is not a weakness. It's a requirement for our own health outcomes. And it could be your gift to the world if you're a strong, healthy worker who helps others. And if that sounds a little dramatic to you, I want to remind you that we are not that far away from a worldwide pandemic and that there are lots of traumas and tragedies going on out there and we need you. So, do all these things that you can to take care of yourself. Focus on what you should. You know which one you do okay at. As a matter of fact, look at that list of six, and I want you to think about which one are you best at. And then, of course, I want you to think about which one are you horrible at. What do you never want to pay attention to, and you know you ought to a little bit, okay? All right. So you may have heard about the polyvagal theory. Um, it, it got popular hmm, five, between five and 10 years ago. It's not been around for that long. Polyvagal theory is um, about how your nervous system detects and responds to things, okay? And another word or another phrase for the polyvagal nerve network is the social engagement system, okay? And what we want to do is activate your social engagement system. So one of the ways that you can do this is to tune in to how your body's feeling. Are you comfortable? Are you uncomfortable? Are you aware of people around you? Are you not? Okay, tune in to how your body's feeling. Do you have pain points? Do you have tingling? Do you have any of the things? But get used to sort of checking out your own body. What are those nerves doing in there? Be aware of them. Then use your breath. Breathing can be a powerful way to self-regulate. Okay, so follow your breath in and out of your body. And, and folks, I'm not, again, I'm not asking you to do this for hours. This is a few moments of your time. Feel yourself get stressed or upset. Take a breath. Feel your body. How's it going? Connect with people. Okay? Connecting with other people is engaging your social engagement system. If there's nobody to socialize with, and sometimes there's not, 
visualize somebody you trust, or even if you have a pet that makes you feel connected, that's fine too. It doesn't matter. Um, and it doesn't have to be a real person or um, you can't imagine the person, uh, but connecting with other people activates your social engagement system, your nervous system of your body. Okay. As a matter of fact, let's do a quick little exercise. Sit back in your chair, roll your shoulders back a little bit. You can turn your camera off if you want, if you feel like people are looking at you, because I don't want you to be nervous, but you don't have to. I'm not going to turn mine off, but I roll my shoulders back a little bit. And I allow my eyes um, to close or just gaze down in front of me. And I'm going to take you on a little imaginary walk, okay? So you're walking somewhere. You're walking somewhere that you're comfortable. And you see a bench where you could sit down. Walk over to the bench and have a seat. Feel comfortable in your seat. And look up. And off in the distance, you see a person coming towards you and you realize, I love that person. That's one of my favorite people. And I want you to watch that person walking closer to you. They're coming right towards you. They're getting closer. They can see you and you are so, what? So happy or so comfortable or so pleased that they're coming right towards you. And then they smile, a really big smile at you. And how does that make you feel in your body? They keep walking towards you. They sit down next to you on the bench and you're both just present. Take a nice deep breath and exhale and come on back to the present moment. Your friend is gone. How many of you, I'm not gonna stop this for just a second. If you bothered to do the exercise with me, how many of you could feel a change in your body by seeing a friend? Anybody? And that's just your imagination. It's not even real life. How exciting if it were really happening, right? That's how powerful the social engagement system is. You can just imagine it sometimes and it will absolutely make you feel better. So let me go back to this and say again, connect with people. And if there's nobody to connect with, close your eyes and imagine the person you'd like to connect with for a moment or two. The last thing on this particular slide is harness those anxious thoughts. Sometimes we get interfered with because we're worried. We're worried, we're overwhelmed. Uh, I'm stressed out today because I have a lot of work I have to do and I needed to like sit still and get into this training for a few hours. Um, and But I could worry or fret about those things, but instead, Try to recognize your fretting, your anxious, your thinking, anxious thoughts. Can you take a breath and let them go even for just a moment? Okay. Activating the social engagement system this way and being able to know how your body feels, calm down with the breath, connect with other people, even if it's just in your imagination and recognizing ancient, anxious thoughts for what they are and pushing them aside for a moment. This activation can have a snowball effect uh, from a woman named uh, Ruth Lanius, and um, she was the director of the PTSD research unit at the University of Western Ontario, um, wrote several articles and talked about it, saying that activating the ventral vagus nerve, which is your polyvagal system, okay, it also activates your prefrontal cortex or the part of your brain that deals with logic. And a lot of times trauma deactivates that, right? Trauma make, blocks it from you and you can't get to your prefrontal cortex. But taking a breath, thinking about people you love or enjoy time with, that activates that social engagement system, connects you directly with your prefrontal cortex 
And that's the part of your brain that deals with logic. If you can calm yourself, it allows you to think clearly and process what might be a very difficult circumstance for you, which will further resolve your stress. One of the problems is we get all tight and stressed out and we can't resolve it because we're, we're tight and stressed out. And if you could engage your social engagement system and relax and breathe and connect, answers will come to you. It will resolve your stress. We should all learn more about polyvagal activation, but time is short. And so for today, I'm gonna to give you, I've given you this slide and I'll give you four quick things to do to step out of that na anxious narrative and check in with yourself. So you pause and tune into your body because it's gonna give you options about what you should do. You take a nice breath and that helps activate your parasympathetic nervous system. Think about reaching out and helping somebody else because that gives you that double shot of dopamine and you want those feel good neurotransmitters floating around in your brain. And finally, shake it off. So shaking completes a stress cycle. Animals do this shake thing. Animals do this whole thing where they shake it off when something uh, stresses them out. You've seen horses do it. You've seen dogs do it. You might not have thought about it, but it's what they're doing is they're de-stressing. They're going through the stress cycle and releasing it. So um, think about uh, what are you willing to do? You may uh, be willing to do one, two, three, or all, all four of these things, but you have a choice about how you respond to stress once you understand this. And you don't have to react from your stress response system if you can activate that central nervous system. Activate that poly, polyvagal nerve network and realize that stress doesn't have to be bad for you, but being stuck in stress is bad for you. So move your body, move your body a lot. Um, and that's the shake activity. Now, mm, yep, I have time for it, so I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna invite you to do the shake activity because, well, let me, I wanna see you. How many people have, have done or seen this shake activity? Anybody? Maybe, hi, Bianca. And maybe Leanne, did you raise your hand, Leanne? Yeah. So the shake activity makes people feel horribly conspicuous and they don't really like to do it in front of other people. Um, but I'm gonna tell you, first of all, if we all do it, we're all doing it together. And secondly, it's so dramatically impactful. I, I hope that you're willing to go along with it and try this activity out. And I'm going to uh, slide back from my desk and I'm looking at the timer because here's the trick. You're gonna have to get yourself to shake, to, to shake. And you're going to start with arms and legs and things, and that's going to be fine. Um, but you have to do it for a sustained amount of time. And it's a minimum of two minutes for it to really detoxify your body. But I'm going to invite you to participate. I'm going to stand up, and I'm going to invite you to stand up with me. If you feel too self-conscious, feel free to turn your camera off. But I strongly encourage you to follow my directions about the shake activity. And when you come across children or adolescents or family members who are super stressed out, you should teach them the shake activity. The other thing that some people do, and I'm not going to bother trying to line it up that way for you right now, is they put music on in the background so that you're shaking to some music. But let me get a little bit more space here. There we go. Okay. So what we're gonna do is I'm, yep, I'm ready to start. And we're gonna start by shaking our arms. And so just feel oh, them shake. And you're gonna shake your arms and your fingers and then start adding the upper arms and the shoulders. Now don't get too wild, like don't break your arm or anything, okay? But just get a nice little shake going there. Then 
pick up one leg and shake that leg while you're still shaking the arms. Then shake the other leg. And how about we add our hips in a little bit, back and forth with the hips. And then can you get your waist into it? You could even move your head and roll it around a little bit. And by the way, we are now approaching one minute of the shake. So you're almost halfway there. Kick those legs out again. Give those feet a shake all the way down to the toes. Shake that booty. Move your back. Move your ribs. Move your belly. Keep shaking. We're only at one minute and 15 seconds. We got to keep going for another 45 seconds. You can do it. Shake high, shake low, shake your booty, move your hips. Keep doing it. I know it's ridiculous, isn't it? But just keep doing it. And whew, you're letting out so much stress. You're letting out some tension. You're letting your body release things. You are activating the polyvagal network. Oh my gosh, we're almost there. We have 10, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Now relax all those body parts. Happy New Year, Mark. What do you feel? Close your eyes. Don't look at me. Don't look at us. Close your eyes. What do you feel in your body? So those are tiny things that can really put a dent in um, stress and anxiety. The shaking or vibrating helps to release muscular tension. It burns up some excess adrenaline that backs up on you when you're stressed out. It calms your nervous system to its neutral state and it manages stress levels across your entire body. And you don't have to take a medicine or go for a five mile run. A two minute shake can really reset your nervous system. All right, there's lots more ideas about how to be resilient and um, there's different ways or different um, categories of resilience. So these next few slides are gonna go over different types. And the first one is calm resilience. We just worked on stress, okay? De-stressing de is one way to be resilient, is take the time to de-stress. But this is calm resilience. And I have five different things on here for you. The first one is called take five. And it's a way to ground yourself in, wherever you are. And it's a way you can help somebody else ground if they need it to. Okay. So grounding means calming um, or being okay in the moment where you are. And um, the way you do take five is you, you're going to count backwards from five to one. And you have to, and we can do it together right now, um, name five things that you can see. So just let your eyes travel around in front of you and name five things. Like I could say blue pen, hole in the wall, camera, a little penguin, and a bottle of water. Name five things that you can see. Now, name four things that you can touch. Make them different things and do reach out and touch them. So I'm touching a calculator, a mouse, a piece of paper, and my knees. Next, name three things that you can hear. So get quiet, and one of them's gonna be my voice, but what other two things can you hear? And then two things that you can smell. Can you detect any smells? Can you pick something up and smell it? I have coffee sitting over here. Mm. Mm. Might as well keep it here because the last one is one thing that you can taste. 
Do you have a taste or a sensation in your mouth? That is a calming activity. It's not quite as magical as the shake, but if you can get people to stop and focus on those things, they can uh, be calmer. The next one I call get out. It's about going outside and no, we're not taking a break and sending you outside. So you just have to imagine it for a minute. But go outside and when you get outside, take a nice slow breath. And what do you hear outside? Maybe birds and insects. What do you smell outside? Is it fresher than your office or your house or wherever you are? Can you smell trees, plants, flowers, those sorts of things? Just getting out into green space can be calming. Being in green space absolutely calms ADHD. The next calming activity or grounding activity uh, touchdown is when you take off your shoes and rub your feet into the carpet or the floor. So you are just being present where you are and feeling yourself in this place. Another one is to ride the breath. There is a breathing exercise, the four, seven, eight breathing exercise. And the way it works, it activates your prefrontal cortex. And um, the way it works is you, you're you counting. So to the count of four, one, two, three, four, I'm breathing in. So I'm taking in as much air as I can as I think about counting till four. Then I hold it while I count to seven. And then I slowly blow out as if through a straw to the count of eight. It takes a minute to catch this pattern. And sometimes I'm like, I'm only at six and I ran out of air or something. But um, if you do that only a few times, it's not like I want you to breathe that way regularly, but it really slows your metabolism down and it really activates your um polyvagal system, your calming system, okay? And then the last one on here isn't so much an exercise as uh, maybe a little habit. Do you do any handiwork? Do you color? Do you knit? Do you craft? Do you crochet? Do you paint? Do you um, anything, especially things with repetitive motions? They doing things can take your mind off of um, whatever it is that's disturbing you. Essentially, folks, all of these things bring your body back to the present moment instead of wherever your nervous system is taking you. And they're probably potential scenarios of the future. Like I've got to give this report today or I'm, I'm worried about meeting with my boss later or Playing, replaying the past. Why did I say that? Why did I do that? I can't believe I this has happened. Uh, those sorts of things. And a lot of times um, we're either worrying about the future or regretting the past and it's making us uncomfortable and anxious. And grounding activities are designed to help us feel calm and more current, more present in the to this moment instead of worrying about the future or the past. So all of these things serve to bring you into the present moment. All right, um, mindfulness practices. So that's a different kind of um, resilience and mindfulness practices strengthen your reflective resilience or your thinking resilience. And so I, I'm giving you a series of them. You don't have to do or like them all, but something might appeal to you. So I don't know how many of you might be meditators. Nice. I just look at my chat again, make sure I wasn't missing any questions. Uh, but meditation is a way to strengthen your reflective practice. And there's all kinds of meditations. I gave you one called loving kindness meditation. And there's one at the end here that I'll, I'll do with you in a few minutes. But um you can have um, meditation where you just try to clear your mind. And when thoughts come into your head, you let them float back out and you just 
follow your breath. That's a, a very typical kind of meditation. Um, and there are a lot of apps that help you with meditation. And so you can look those up and see what you, what interests you or not. Um, but meditation is definitely one of the things that can strengthen your reflective resilience. Another thing is writing. So some people don't want to just sit and meditate, but maybe they're journalers. They keep a diary or they write a journal or you could write um, letters of gratitude to people in your life, one a day, or you could write a um, gratitude list of some sort, things I'm grateful for today, those sorts of things. Some people find writing easier than sitting quietly and meditating. Um, and it doesn't mean you couldn't do both, right? Um, another uh, reflective resilience practice are gratitude practices. I mentioned those already. But um, there are many, many ways to do gratitude practices. Some people talk about um, laying in bed at night and thinking of three things that they're grateful for. Some people do it at the dinner table with their kids and say, who, you know, tell me one good thing or one great thing about your day today. And you're getting people used to thinking about the positive things. Um, and then another way to strengthen your reflective practice is positive intentions. So um, thoughtfully and thoughtfully identify and state or write down your positive intentions for the day or for tomorrow or or for whatever. Sometimes people do this at like um, anniversary points or New Year's Day or things like that, but um, it's really a great way to regularly align yourself with your own values. I intend um, uh, to be supportive and helpful to people in my trainings. And uh, I intend that just about every day. And so it's not about getting it right, but about moving in the right direction. Okay. And all of these things, um, again, you don't have to do them all, but pick something that appeals to you and try practicing that. Now, um, we have... Um, Let me see. Yep. There we go. This is a, this is another meditation and this one's called radical kindness. So the other one was loving kindness, a meditation. And you, you would start with yourself and move out to somebody else. And then somebody who might irritate you. This one is really just about you because a lot of people, um, maybe all people, we are our own worst critics. No one can be harder on ourselves than we are on ourselves. And many of us say, oh, I can't, I can't believe I did that. I'm so stupid or I'm this or I'm that. None of it's complimentary, right? And so um, it's a really bad habit to, to have and to do. And um, this particular meditation is trying to break you from being your own worst enemy. Okay. Now, I like this kind of meditation where they have these phrases that you repeat because A, I don't have to think, okay? I, I'm i tired or I just want this rote practice um, and I don't have to think it up. It's something that I'm gonna do regularly, like that loving kindness meditation. The other reason I like these rote practices is because this particular type of meditation is very highly researched and it has a lot of data to support um, that using these practices change how people feel and how they approach life. And so um, I'm going to show you all of these statements and, and, um, and then we're going to go through this. And again, I encourage you, if you want to, to do this meditative practice with me, it's going to take about three minutes. Okay. And so the first statement is, may I allow myself to be imperfect? And then you need to repeat that out loud if you're if you're alone and willing to say it three times. I'm going to say them out loud here three times, and you can say it along with me if you want. You do not have to participate if you don't want. But this is an interesting way to get us to think more kindly about ourselves and to ourselves. So I'm going to start again. May I allow myself to be imperfect? May I allow myself to be imperfect. May I allow myself to be imperfect. 
May I accept myself just as I am. May, may I accept myself just as I am. May I accept myself just as I am. May I trust that I am enough right now. May I trust that I am enough right now. May I trust that I'm enough right now. And may I remember there are people who care about me. May I remember there are people who care about me. May I remember there are people who care about me. That's it. Saying this out loud to yourself once a day can help you defeat that monster that sits on your shoulder and tells you, you are, you're supposed to be perfect. And that um, you'll only accept yourself after what? You get a promotion, you lose 10 pounds, you exercise more regularly, you go to bed at 10. I don't know. We do it to ourselves all the time. That we say, I, I, I accept myself mostly, but I, I really ought to change. And then that third one, trust that you're enough right now. You don't have to change anything. You are enough exactly as you are. But we spend so much time beating ourselves up that we have a hard time understanding or believing that. And finally, most people have people, other people who do actually care about them. And we want to remember that. And sometimes we want to, uh, sometimes I interrupt others or myself by saying, would you say that about your son or daughter? Would you want somebody to say that to your mother? Would you want, you know, and think about people that we really love. And would you allow people to be like, Ugh, you're not worth it. Or you really have to do, uh, you know, lose that weight or get that degree or get a better job. Or it's always like, we're going to accept ourselves when we're better, but we're humans, we're imperfect. And we're never going to be completely all better. And so these kinds of sentences, um, what they really do is they lay these neural pathways that help us be more self-accepting. All right, I have a couple more things to get through. I'm gonna rush through them because we only have five minutes left together. But there's a lot of reasons to um, increase um, your social resilience. And we get together with other people for a variety of reasons some of which are commonalities. We get together because we have something in common. We do the same job. We like the same football team. We um, go to the same church, whatever it is. We have commonalities and we tend to socialize with those people. Sometimes we're, um, we're connected with people through storytelling um, and we wanna know, we wanna tell our stories and um, they wanna tell stories to us about what's going on. Really, you could think of human existence as just story by story by story, what happened to you sort of stories. Um, also, we connect um, with others uh, for modeling. And so kids look to the adults in their world and particularly in their family for how should they react and respond and do things. And so we want to remember that we're modeling things a lot. And is it what we want to be modeling? And who do we look to as models? And finally, um, we connect with others um, to rehearse things. We connect with others to talk about, hey, I'm thinking about this thing. I might wanna get a new job or I'm thinking about proposing to this person or um, uh, I wish I uh, could build my own house. I, I don't know what it is, but um, we, we try ideas out on other people and that also is helpful to us. So there's a lot of reasons to um, be social, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. And there's a lot of ways to measure or evaluate our social support network, because we all have our own social support network. And it's so much more than just having a friend or two. So let's take a quick look at all the components of our social connections. And I want you to think about, while we look at these, a decent friend or colleague and how does your relationship stack up? Because these are all ways that we could measure or relate to people. 
And so partly your connections are how intense or frequent or long do your connections last? Um, another thing might be how available is that person to me and how available am I to them? And it's not always perfectly balanced, right? Are you dependable? Do you have dependable people in your life? Um, and how responsive are you when people need you? That sort of thing. What is the size or diversity of your social network? And do you socialize more with work people or non-work people? Is it more of a social group? And then finally, what's the perceived quality of support? So how do your relationships stack up with all of these different me measurements? And remember that more is not always better. While we want quality relationships, no single relationship can do all of the things for you. So like SAMHSA's six guiding principles, there is um, a resilience plan in your handouts. And it walks you through all of these sorts of things. Self-care, self-compassion, regulating activities, safety and resources, and our opportunities and skills, routines and schedules, supportive connections. And I want you to think about, you spent three hours with me today, and what are you willing to do to stay healthy? What are you willing to do about the fact that you suffer from a certain amount of secondary traumatic stress? I hope some of you pull out that safe, that not a safety plan, a resilience plan and put some things on it. And, um, and if you ever want, uh, you're welcome to get in touch with me and, and ask questions or tell me what you decided to do. But, you know, who's going to take care of you if it's not you? Everybody needs a resiliency plan.